All right, so welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're looking at review for the Contemporary Globalization Exam. And being that this is a unit that follows historical globalization, the test is going to begin by contrasting the time of historical globalization with contemporary. More specifically, we're looking at those globalizing agents. That in historical globalization, we had people engaging in imperialism, creating colonies for king and queen. Uh, today, we have agents of globalization, the children of Bretton Woods, the pillars of contemporary globalization, the IMF, the World Bank, and they are doing the same thing. They are imperializing. They are controlling, because that's what imperialism is. They're controlling pockets of people around the world, but they don't do it in the same manner. Instead, the IMF, the World Bank, they'll come in, and they will offer advice. So remember Bolivia, Cuchabamba. The Bolivian people in the city of Cuchabamba, the government needed money to invest in its infrastructure. The World Bank said, we will help you with the, the money that you require, but we're going to give you some structural adjustment advice. You have to privatize your government utilities. And this advice isn't negotiable. If you want the money, you have to privatize. And they ended up privatizing the utility that is water. These structural adjustments are used to control countries around the world, not dissimilar to the way that monarchies once controlled colonies around the world. So the imperialism of the past is seen today through institutions and, and corporations. One of the dominant themes of this unit has been, you know, to what extent is globalization and the progress we're making sustainable? That's a concept you should expect to see tomorrow and on Friday. Well, how do we measure that? There's a lot of related ideas to sustainability. We're going to see the word disparity on the test. Best situation right now, by the way, would be sitting there saying, you know what, I don't have to write any of this down. I know it. I know what disparity means. So if you know what disparity means, don't copy it down. But if you don't know, then ears should be up, right? So disparity means have and have not. Usually we talk about economic disparity, rich and poor, the 1% and the 99%. It always doesn't have to be economic. We could be contrasting something else. We often talk about a technological gap, <coughs> those who have technology and those who have not technology. Maybe you have some friends that have a, a new phone and you don't have a phone at all, so there's a example of disparity, have and have not. We also have the idea of global sameness. To what extent have we accomplished homogenization? Global sameness. Could you travel to Reykjavik and experience a very similar day in the market in Reykjavik, in Iceland? Could you travel to Poland? <coughs> Could you travel to Somalia? Could you travel to Bhutan and have a similar day? Or are we not there yet in terms of globalization and homogenization? Would we, if we lived in different countries in the world, would we potentially have a different quality of life, a different standard of living based upon the socioeconomic and political realities in that country? Are there factors domestically in countries like Bhutan that, that make the, the standard of living quality of life different? And we could argue that although we're marching towards global sameness, we haven't achieved it yet. We haven't achieved it yet. Another term that you're likely to see is the term economy of scale. This course began by a discussion of economy of scale. You know, why don't we manufacture everything Wetaskiwinites need here in Wetaskiwin? Well, Wetaskiwin's a city of 13,000. If we made everything locally, that there's a, a built-in inefficiency there. When we talk about economy of scales, I mentioned that there's a city in China that their focus is clothing hangers, that they make clothing hangers for the world. So because they produce in bulk, they can cut down the per unit cost. That's an economy of scale. And we see that as people around the world, globalization, one of the main reasons we globalize is economic. We take advantage of economies of scale. We localize manufacturing, and 
then that final product gets pushed out to the world. So we localize it in places like northern Mexico where labor might be cheaper or more skilled and then they can export cars to the world. If every country had to make all of their own cars, there wouldn't be an economy of scale for each country. China has 1.4 billion consumers, so does India. There's an economy of scale there. But a country like Canada with only 40 million people, there might not be a per, per unit cost effectiveness of building everything domestically. What we've also seen with globalization is a term called upward economic mobility, meaning that you might be born in poverty, but you might be able to jump a social economic class or two, that you might be able to see the, your plight improve. Uh, unfortunately, in the last decade, for the first time in more than the last century, what we're seeing is that the upward economic mobility has began to slow and in some cases reverse. That there's no guarantee now that your life will be better than your parents. But when they were your age, it was almost the expectation that lives were improving. Houses would get better. We'd have more opportunity for leisure, bigger houses. But that upward economic mobility seems to have hit a ceiling and some of us have bounced off of it and our lives seem to be getting worse. Some countries' life expectancy is going down. Literacy rates are going down, meaning less people know how to read. One thing that you should expect to see on the test is being forced to unpack a source from the perspective of somebody in your cast of characters. So from the perspective of Adam Smith, from the perspective of Karl Marx. So if you go into the test not remembering the difference between those two individuals, what are their values? What are their assumptions about the way that the marketplace should be run? Within that, the role of government and, and consumers, then you're gonna be uh, left guessing. So from the perspective of Adam Smith, you know, globalization has done what? So you have to look at the outcome of globalization. You know, if more and more people are moving past their primary means of transportation is feet, more and more people have cars now. And now we have a sizable part of our population that can travel by airplane. What would Adam Smith would say is happening there? Would he support this? Would he challenge the premise of globalization creating opportunities for people to travel differently? The first concept we really landed on in this unit was Bretton Woods. Chapter 9, second half of chapter 9, Bretton Woods. So we will have some questions about Bretton Woods, more specifically about the World Bank, the IMF, and GATT. So you're going to see charts, there's going to be information on the page, and you might have to identify that these things have in common that they are the children of Bretton Woods, but you might also want to review why did they meet at Bretton Woods? What challenges were they facing that forced them to do uh, this paradigm shift towards more global cooperation? You may remember it was the, the threat of the rise of communism. It was the inefficiency of global tariffs during the Great Depression. It was the cost of war that was a consequence of competition. These things forced them to negotiate a new world order. You're going to have some charts to unpack. So have fun with that. Um, you're going to have a scatter graph that is going to contrast this, the social progress index with countries per capita GDP. So you're going to need to come to class tomorrow ready to look at a a scatter graph chart and say, okay, if Central African Republic has a per capita GDP of $1,000 and the lowest social progress index at about 30, and if Kuwait has the highest per capita GDP at you know, 75,000 and it's in the middle of social progress index at about 70, what kind of correlation or causation can we conclude here? Is there a causation where low per capita GDP causes a low social progress index? Is one measurement on this graph caused by the other? Is a low social progress index the result of lower GDP? 
We're going to have quotes related to that, like if growth is seen as the pancreas to social programs, trade is seen as the way to get growth. So another theme that we had in this unit, Contemporary Globalization, is the trade-off between economics and ecology, economics and the environment. So there'll be some questions that force you to consider this. The impact of economic intervention is especially apparent in Europe, where the Eurozone has promoted not only peace and increased trade among nations, but also labor mobility. So we're going to have questions that make you consider the, the EU and how through trade the EU has created social progress, like labor rights. So there's going to be some sources for you to unpack tomorrow, which we always like because it's not a matter of just memorizing. It's about application. You're going to have to remember some specific events. It's going to talk about things like Brexit. It's going to talk about uh, the alliance, the anti-communist alliance. It's going to talk about the USMCA and tariffs against uh, during the Great Depression. But it's not enough just to know that during the Great Depression there were tariffs. But you'll have to link it to a perspective. If the perspective is, if growth is seen as the pancreas to social programs, trade is seen as the best way to get growth. Trade is the way to see, seen as the best way to get growth, then we'll say these are four events we studied, which one increased trade? Which one links with that idea that trade increases growth? Is it Brexit? Is it creating an anti-communist group? Is that promoting trade? Is it the creation of free trade groups like USMCA? Or is it raising tariffs. So that's the application side of social studies. Not about memorization, it's about application of things we've studied. Things you're familiar with, but you don't have to memorize all of the details of the USMCA. You know, USMCA 14th point, or you know, what year was it? You know, how much did the United States or Mexican uh, imports go up? It's more about how does the USMCA reflect globalization? And what was the result of it? We often have you do, like you do in an A1, a relationship paragraph. But in multiple choice, we'll have questions like combining elements of source one and two. What's a conclusion we can make? So combining elements of the quote that said trade leads to social progress. Then looking at the scatter chart and looking at GDP per capita and social progress, what can we say? Can we say that it is building social progress or not? Said a lot about the social progress index. Might be something to look up vocabulary-wise and make sure you know what it means. The social progress index. There'll be a question that says it includes all of the following except social progress index, opportunity, basic human needs, foundations of well-being, chance for personal transcendence. Which one of those is not a part of the SPI? So you have to go back in your notes, find the SPI. Simply look up you know, what is included and what is not included. Again, there'll be questions like, from the perspective of Adam Smith, that could also be phrased, advocates of capitalism. An advocate of capitalism would respond to a source with what? Opposition or support and why? So you'll have to be able to, again, unpack that. And we literally have a question here taken as a set. All three sources present information about something. So as a group, you guys have shown some tremendous growth on your A1. Questions 5 to 9, it's basically an A1. There's three sources, and we're asking questions that if you were doing an A1, you should be breaking it down. The context of it, though, is social progress index. You might want to go back and look at that. Questions 10 to 14, this time there's going to be four sources. It's a little bit, a little richer. But some of them are quite short. Globalization provides a mirror into the exploitive nature of mankind. That's a quick source. One of the themes of the course is if this, then what? If mankind is exploitive, then what kind of relationships should we form with others? So we have one quote that says we're exploitive. Naturally, there's going to be another quote that is going to show that maybe we're not exploitive. Maybe we're the opposite. Maybe we help others. And then there might be some, some quotes in the middle, or in this case, there's also a cartoon that may demonstrate that exploitation. 
So you're going to have to be creating those relationships again. Now, even if the context of one of the sources is a country like Bangladesh, and you're like, man, I don't remember studying Bangladesh, the test isn't about Bangladesh. The test is about globalization. We're using Bangladesh to see if you can recognize the themes, the concepts that we have studied. So for example, the first question on this set of four sources will be which of the following questions could best be researched with these four sources? Once again, that's an A1 question, isn't it? That's a relationship paragraph A1 question. Taken as a set, all, in this case, four sources share the common question. And the language in the questions is very much from lesson 14. Are they pursuing self-interest or benefiting the common good? Are they conforming to social norms or are they regulated by the state? Individualism versus collectivism is a lens that we've been trying to look at this course. Then we're going to try to get you to create relationships. In response to source one, the source that says globalization is a mirror into our exploitive nature, what would elements within source two, three, and four say? So source four is a quote from Elon Musk. What would Elon Musk say in response based upon his, his tweet that we have here? What would the cartoonist in source three say? Or what would the people in source three say, the patient, big pharmaceuticals? We've already had a question from the perspective of Adam Smith. Logically, we're going to have one from Karl Marx. Of the four sources, which shows what Karl Marx was concerned about. You can't get number 12 right if you don't remember what Karl Marx was concerned about. Going back to lesson 14, we need to know that Karl Marx saw the world divided upon, among classes, socioeconomic classes. One class was exploiting the other. That he thought that the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, were exploiting the proletariat, the workers. And that eventually there would be an epiphany among the workers and they would rise up. If we have one, which one is perspective of Karl Marx, logically there's going to be one that says which one is reflective of the values of a capitalist. And then finally we have a Robert Owen question, cast of characters. If you get to the question, the test tomorrow and you're like, Mr. McBride, I don't remember Robert Owen, I'll be like, I guess this is a test that you're not prepared for. In your cast of characters, we have Adam Smith as a capitalist, we have Karl Marx as a communist, you studied Owen as a socialist. Someone that's similar to Marx wanted egalitarianism, equality, but unlike Marx, didn't believe that we needed to use violence as a means to get there. There's a cartoon, number 15, that I actually made. So, I mean, I didn't draw it, but it's, it's like a meme that I made more than anything. It's looking at 1944 and the shift in global uh, policies focus, Bretton Woods, and saying, why did they shift? Is it because they were scared of fascism in 1944? Was it communism that they feared? Was it the environmental concerns or decolonization? What forced them to the negotiation table? That should be an easy question. We're about halfway through this now for tomorrow. And uh, we get to a, a longer, longer quote. Um, so there's some reading comprehension that you're going to have to do. So in the reading comprehension, you're going to need to find things like, what is the tone? What is the purpose? So reading in context, the underlining tone in the source could be found in which line? When it says this, 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 or this. So your ability to find tone in a passage will be tested tomorrow. Your ability to find fo uh, purpose will be tested tomorrow. And once again, we'll be asking you questions like, how would an advocate of capitalism respond to this quote? Would they oppose it? Would they counter it? Would they support it? And why? We've talked about individualism. No doubt we'll talk about collectivism as well. From a collectivist position, how should we respond to the source? So a lot of skills tomorrow. There's going to be an argument um, about the media and about whistleblowers and about corporations and corptocracy and legitimacy and the will of the people. We've talked about democracy and some of the threats to the democracy from transnational corporations. 
I believe that to be lesson 16. We need to go back. We need to review transnational corporations and look at how the military industrial complex rose up. And because of the power of the MIC, they're able to, to some extent, manipulate government policies in the United States. And that hollows out democracy. Because instead of following the will of all people, now the government seems to be the, the puppet of some, the corporate, the corporate elite. We spent some time looking at Ray Anderson in this unit. We're going to have the Ray Anderson quote, the quote that we talked about already. So you're going to have that long quote about drawing the metaphor, about the, the plane crashing. Um, you don't have to memorize it. It's here on the page. But there'll be questions like, the reason that the poor fool thinks he's flying is because of what? It's interpretation. To continue the metaphor, the fuel for the airplane is what? These are great questions. They make you think critically and hypothetically. If you do well on this test, you know you're ready for Social 20-1. There'll be a specific cartoon looking at uh, tariffs in the United States. And you have to look at details within the cartoon and see if the cartoonist is you know, critical of tariffs, valuing tariffs, wants independence or interdependence. Do they want economic protectionism or isolationism? We'll be able to attach terms that we've studied like this is a nationalist perspective or an internationalist perspective or a supranationalist perspective or even an ultra-nationalist perspective. So those terms will certainly come up. There will be some quotes about the sustainability and uh, you know, the ecological contamination due to the externalities of economic activities. And through those quotes, we'll ask you about What kind of perspective are we seeing? Is it nationalist? Is it collectivist? Is it internationalist? Is it individualist? That sort of thing. And then the test ends with questions that we say have no sources. So the last six questions have no sources. And it's like, which one of the following was not a consequence of Bretton Woods? So if you know the, the pillars that come out of Bretton Woods, then you look at it and say, oh, yeah, no, that one didn't come from there. Or in terms of citizenship, the topic that we've been looking at most recently, an element of citizenship within economics. How can a consumer show global citizenship? There'll be a question about peak oil, about the death of birth. There'll be questions about uh, fiscal monetary policy, Keynesian economics from Chapter 9. And the year began with the simulation of homogenization and Americanization. So it would be a question that sees to what extent you remember that part of the year. The first 35 questions of this test, you'll get tomorrow. That's a review of the first 35. I'm going to end this video, and then we'll see if you have any questions. And then we'll look at the second set.